started thinking about making a film, my first film, in 1998. And I think in 99, her birthday was announced on NPR. And she was announced as the first black woman elected to Congress. So I was like, wow, she's still alive. How great. This is, you know, this is, th that, that would be a great story to tell. And I went to my Paula Giddings book, When and Where I Enter, mm -hmm. <laughs> the story of us <laughs> in the United States of America. And I flipped through and read the parts about Shirley Chisholm. And I was astonished that I had read in college and totally dismissed her run for president, like foolishness. I wrote in the margins, foolishness or something like that. Mm. And I said to myself, oh my goodness, that's the story to tell. But when, we, when I looked at the history books, she was only mentioned. Nobody, the three paragraphs that Paula Giddings wrote was the most extensive look at her presidential run in 1972. So without any roadmap other than doing the research myself, so the film is in a sense original research because nobody would talk about it. I had very famous black uh, political scientists tell me that's a, that's, a, that's a small story. Why don't you talk to a little Brooklyn historian? No, I'm talking about presidential politics and Shirley Chisholm, but the very things that were roadblocks for her, those people went off to write books and create institutions and worthy establishment, so she was still seen in a diminished way. And in fact, it took a long time for me to even talk her into it because she wasn't sure it would be valuable. You know, she had forgotten. She goes, I don't want to bring that up. I don't, you know, I just, she remembered the pain of the moment. And so I, I you know, I had to send her letters and then chocolate and da da da. Right? I, I courted Mrs. Chisholm. And I finally was able to get her on the phone. She wouldn't talk to me the first time. She pretended she didn't know who I was. And the second time, I said, I'll call back same time next week, you know. Um, this was before, she didn't have email for sure. I'm not even sure I had email, <laughs> but yeah. And then finally the third time, I knew this was it. And she picked up the phone and I filibustered her. I remember I was, I was, very, I was very anxious. So I, I went home from work to do it so that I could be as loud as I needed to be and I paced. Mm -hmm. And I basically said, in a, more politely than I'm gonna tell you now, listen woman. <laughs> You have to tell your story. You are a teacher. You know the value of knowing your history, knowing your story. And if you don't tell it, nobody else will. Yeah. Boom! Drop the mic. <laughs> she was, her, her health was ailing. So that's January of 2004. And by 2005, she passed. So she was not able to see the film with an audience. But I did take my v VCR and my VHS copy, which was hot at the time, <laughs> <laughs> down to Florida where she was and sh showed it to her. I mean, this woman had a political career that was very long and is often overlooked in some respects. Um, so why do you think she hasn't come up more in this election cycle? I've actually been surprised how much she's come up in this election cycle in the sense of her image. You know, uh, Hillary Clinton has included her image in various places. Um, and before, that wasn't so much the case. But what's so interesting about Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm and what gets overlooked is not just what gets overlooked, is she's always cast as having run symbolically when what gets overlooked is her strategy. Mm -hmm. She had a really profound political strategy in 1972 to collect delegates, and that's not what, what's, what's, what's written about necessarily, and that's also not what's underlined when her story is remembered. Um, and the thing that I like to talk about is that, you know, it seemed like a real wild card in 1972, mm -hmm. but nobody had given her permission to run for state assembly in 1964. Right? She had a strategy. She executed and she won, right? She was in many ways ahead of her time. Absolutely. Um, and what I find uh, to be inspiring still, I mean, I made this film in 2004, and you know, I still watch parts of it and I get, <laughs> I'm touched by her spirit. Who doesn't need to be reminded to be a little unbought and unbossed sometimes? Absolutely.
right? Who doesn't need to be reminded um, that we're not little, that we can be as big as we can dream? Mm -hmm. And somehow she did not let other people's low expectations of her define her. Absolutely. And we can see that, and that is what I find tremendously inspiring. Unbought and unbossed was not a slogan that she imagined. It was the way she was living her life. Um, and that's powerful. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, and it's true, right? And, and I have to say, I have to say I, 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 my favorite line in, well, well one of them, mm -hmm. I can't say my only, but my favorite, one of my favorite lines in the film is when Ron Dellum says she wasn't asking, she was asserting her right to, to be, be there. there. Absolutely. And that is powerful. She wasn't asking permission for, for these people to support her. She was asserting her right to be there. And culturally, we were not used to this face asserting anything. Absolutely. And so people were like, can you imagine? I can't, I would have loved, like turning on the television and seeing Mrs. Chisholm come out in her fur. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I mean, always look tight. Yeah.